My name is Ken Soren, Wall Street Channel I. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of History and the co-director of the project that helps to fund this uh, lecture series. Uh, my name is Christine Lamberson, and I'm also an assistant professor in the Department of History, and I am the other co-director of the uh, War Stories Project, which is the uh, project that helps fund this event. And so I'm going to talk for just a couple of minutes about what's coming up next semester, and then Dr. Marshall Chanela is going to introduce our speaker for uh, tonight and talk a little bit more about tonight's programming. Uh, so this lecture is part of an ongoing series, as I mentioned, it's the War Stories Project, which is funded by an NEH grant. And next semester we have actually two grants that will be funding our Great War Lecture Series. This NEH grant will be continuing to fund it, and then we also have a grant from the Libraries of America that will help provide additional funding. So we'll have four events next semester that are up here on the posters here. Uh, we'll have one in February. Uh, called Chronicling and Healing Broken Bodies, which is going to be about photography and physical therapy uh, coming out of World War I. And then in March, we have two events. We'll have a guest who's coming um, from uh, Kansas who will be speaking about propaganda. Uh, his talk is called Can the Kaiser Viewing World War I Through American Propaganda Posters? And then we'll have another uh, event that is going to be a round table with uh, veterans, and it'll be about World War I voices and veterans round table. Uh, that event will have some theater students who are bringing some voices from World War I, and then we'll talk with current veterans about the experience of war. And then our final event will be in April, and we'll have two guests who are coming to talk about uh, ethnicity during World War I, uh, and that talk, or those two talks, will be called Texas ethnic minorities during World War I. So we hope you'll all come out to those events as well. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wong Shui Chen Lai to talk about tonight's event. I'll also point out that the event in April, that will be out at Fort Concho, that also corresponds with a traveling exhibit on life on the home front in the United States during World War I. That will be out for the entire month of April at Fort Concho. We'll give you more details on that next semester, but hope you'll uh, come out to see that as well. Our speaker tonight is Professor Jennifer Keane. She is the chair of the Department of History at Chapman University. She is one of the leading experts on the World War I era. She's also president of the Society of Military History. Her publications are too numerous to list, but I'll point out that university bookstores very kindly agreed to stay open, and they're featuring two of her books, Doughboys, The Great War, and The Remaking of America as well as World War I, the American Soldier's Experience. These are great gifts for the history buff in your life. Uh, Professor Keen will be happy to autograph those for you should you be interested as well. So I'm just going to leave it right there and introduce our, welcome our, our speaker to the stage, Professor Jennifer Keen. Department for uh, the invitation and for their hospitality. I've never been here. Um, I'm probably telling you something that you don't know, or that you already know when I tell you that you have a fantastic history department. You should take as many classes as you can with these professors. It's just been a really wonderful afternoon. So my talk today is entitled Brits, Brits Watches, Intelligence Tests, and Hemingway, the Cultural Impact a World War I on America. And what I want to do is really talk about what I think are really the 10 most important impacts that the war has culturally on the United States. And we can think a lot, it's funny, he held up my books and, and it's a lot about the soldiers. I'm not going to say so much about the fighting in France, but more about what the war actually means for the United States. And I think this is an important topic because a lot of Americans really aren't sure about why World War I is important. And so we, we're, we're, we're commemorating it because it was 100 years ago. But that's just so arbitrary. I mean, just because something happened 100 years ago, does that actually mean that it matters to us today? And so what I hope today is to maybe give you some ideas about how parts of your life are shaped by the war, and you may not even actually realize it. Okay. So the first thing that I want to talk about 
is really about the war more globally and kind of get our bearings about where America sort of stands in relationship to other countries that are fighting. And I would like to start with this kind of global view of what the war actually entails. And, and this is a good chart because it, first of all, gives us a sense of all the different nations that are involved. And because this is a war of empires, the British and French Empire, which are very extensive, and they have holdings in Australia and Canada and, and um, New Zealand, uh, the French Empire and Africa, uh, we see people coming from all parts of the globe to actually fight in this war. And because you fight in this war, it means that you also lose men. And if we take a look at this, we can get a first sense of what's always the most striking thing about the First World War, which is just the amazing amount of participation and the equally amazing amount of death and destruction. And so let me just read off for you a few of these statistics to, to really seal this image in your head. So from this chart, we've got a German army, 11 million men serve in this army, and 1.7 million of them are killed during the First World War. The British Empire, which I just mentioned, raises 8.9 million troops, and, a million and, and um, over a million of them are dead. France, the same, almost the exact same number of casualties. Russia is difficult to count because we know there's the revolution in 1917. It gets difficult to separate out casualties caused by the war from the revolution. But a best estimate is 12 million Russians under arms and 1.7 million dead. And so here you've noticed that I'm talking in millions when I talk about deaths for Europe. How does America compare to this kind of astronomical casualty rate. In the United States, we have 4.3 million Americans that serve and 116,000 Americans who are dead by the end of the war. And only half of those actually are combat deaths. The other half come from disease, mostly the Spanish influenza epidemic. It's also worth reminding ourselves that in the most deadly war to date, we also had the most deadly pandemic to date the Spanish flu virus, which circulated the whole globe and actually killed more people worldwide than the war itself. Right? Now, the question we should ask ourselves is, is this number, the number of American dead, a lot or a little? And we always have this problem when we talk about the United States in the First World War. Because our first inclination, I'll bet your first inclination, in the way that I just phrased this question, the way I set you up for it, was to say, oh, it's a little, right? Because it's not a million. It's 52,000 American war dead. It's 116,000 overall. That's not that much when you think about the millions that have been killed in Europe. But what I would like to suggest as my sort of first point here is that numbers can mean only what we can, numbers can mean a lot of things. And in a different context, that number of 116,000 doesn't actually seem like a little, it seems like a lot. And so here we have a chart of understanding that number of war dead, not in comparison to Europe, but understanding it in comparison to other American wars. And here we see that really, it's just the Civil War and World War II that have a higher number of, of, of people killed. If we compare World War I, to Korea and Vietnam, we in fact see that the death is much greater in the First World War than in Korea and Vietnam. And I can make this even seem more amazing to you when I tell you that America in World War I really only fought for six months. So in six months, we had more war dead than we had in Korea, a, a war that lasted three years, and in Vietnam, a war that lasted nine years, right? So in that sense, these 52,000 worded don't seem like a little. They seem like a lot. And to take this point even one step further, just imagine to yourself that in the first six months of fighting in Iraq, 52,000 American coffins came home. I don't think that America would say, oh, that's nothing. So the first thing we really should begin with is to say that it does matter. And it is actually the fact that America took on these casualties. And to the people at the time, this did represent a lot. It represented a lot of death. 
it represented a lot of sacrifice, and not just for the families that were involved, but for American society at large. It, in a sense, reshaped a lot of landscapes that we don't even recognize today were reshaped by this death. There were statues that went up throughout the country, plaques that went up, streets that were renamed, American Legion posts named after the war dead. We create eight cemeteries in France. We never had overseas cemeteries before. All of these things were meant to commemorate the dead. We have a tomb of the unknown soldier in Washington, DC. This is an unknown soldier from World War I. That's when that monument was actually created. So our commemorative landscape recognizes this. We are the ones who have actually forgotten it. Right? So this is one of the very important ways that we can think about America as being shaped by the war. Now, those soldiers that went into the First World War, went into the army, they actually went in to an army that was very different from armies of the past. And this is my second big point here about what World War I does for the United States. In the past, the United States had tended to raise its armies through volunteers. And we had had conscription before, but conscription was always a last resort. It were, there was something sort of dishonorable about being a conscript. It was much more uh, honorable, it was much more highly regarded to volunteer to serve for your country. But in the First World War, Woodrow Wilson makes an almost immediate decision to dispense with this past tradition and instead now raise the mass army primarily through a draft, through conscription. Right? And there were a few reasons for why he decided to do this. One reason was that, if you know m much about your World War I history, you know that the war started in 1914. America doesn't actually enter until 1917. The war had not been popular in the United States. People had argued a lot about whether or not the United States should even get involved. So when, when, when Ridger Wilson asked Congress to declare war, he's not actually 100% sure that he's got the American people behind him. So one factor is just the need to raise an army quickly. Would Americans volunteer in mass if we did not have a draft? Right? So that's one reason. The second reason is, again, because we enter late. It's a very bad moment along the Western Front for the Allied side in 1917. The French army has mutinied. The Germans are getting ready for a new offensive on the Western Front. Can America actually get there in time to make a difference, right? We took us almost a whole year to actually raise, train, transport, and get an army onto the Western Front that was capable of, of making any kind of substantial contribution to the Allied side. If people are sort of dragging their feet to enlist, you're not gonna be able to get that army over there. So that's a second reason to actually uh, use conscription to raise your mass force. But the third reason is maybe the most important reason. And that is that World War I was a total war. And a total war means that, in a sense, you need the entire society to be behind you. You don't just need soldiers in your units. You don't just need soldiers in the front lines. You need workers in your factories. You need farmers in your fields. You need people driving trains, people loading ships, people building ships. You need all of this civilian manpower behind you in order to keep that army going forward. Right? You, in a sense, need everybody to participate. And in that way, Woodrow Wilson was, in a sense, saying to the American people, every man, in the sense every man, has a job to do. And he didn't call the draft the draft. They didn't even really call it conscription. They called it what we still call it. Brand new idea to call it this. Selective service. Right? We're going to call it selective service, because you're selected to serve in the military, you're selected to stay at home and work in a factory. But everybody has a responsibility to the war effort. Everybody has to do something. If you quit your job in the war factory, into the army you go. Right? You're going to serve the war in some kind of way. And it also helped rebrand the idea of conscription from something negative to something positive. You're drafted. Well, that makes it sound like you've been forced to do something you don't want to do. You're selected. That's an honor, right? That's a completely different way to think about this conscription process. 
And this would be something that had a big legacy in the United States. We would turn to conscription in the 20th century again and again and again to raise our mass armies. We'd use conscription in World War II, we'd use it in Korea, we'd use it for a long time in Vietnam until the con controversies around the draft made it untenable. And we went back to the way we used to do it, which was to raise our armies through volunteers. So just this process by which we actually raised our army was going to affect the lives of millions and millions of civilians in the future, because now they would be um, eligible to be drafted into the military when America fought its wars. Right? Now the third thing might be a little surprising to you, because this really affects almost every student in the room. So you're, you've decided on war. You know that the war is likely to have a high casualty rate. You know you're going to uh, need to raise a large army. You've decided to raise it through conscription. But now you have another problem, which is that conscription is in some ways almost too successful. Millions of American men agree to register. Millions agree to show up and be inducted. And now you have an army that was very small before the war. 150,000 people, the regular army. And now suddenly this army is going to expand to over 4 million men in a matter of a year. Right? That's hard for an organization to do. You got all these guys coming in. You have no idea what skills they have. Where should this person go? Yes, he's going to be a soldier, but the modern army is a complex organization. Should this person fire a machine gun? Should they be an infantryman? Should they be a pilot? Should they be an officer? Should they load ships? Should they put boxes on ships? Right? What skills do they actually have? How can we know where to put the best man for the best job. And this is where experts in a brand new discipline step up and offer their services to the Army. And that's the new field of psychology. Psychology is a brand new field at the time of World War I. Not really legitimate yet. Not really sure what value it has. And they step in and they say, we have the answer for you. The answer is intelligence tests. <coughs> Let's give these guys intelligence tests. And that's going to tell us how smart they are, what their aptitude is, and then we're going to know actually what we want to do with them. And so I have some examples up here of some of the very early intelligence tests that were given to these recruits. Now, right from the very beginning, the first thing that the psychologists were themselves surprised about was the fact that they had designed two types of tests. So you have a test over here, and this is a test for literate recruits, people who could read. And then you had a test over here, and this was a series of tests for people who could not read, who were considered illiterate. And they had expected the vast majority of people to be able to take this, maybe a handful of people needing to take the illiterate test. And much to their surprise, way more people needed to take the test for illiterates than they had suspected. Almost 25% of the entire army, and then depending on racial categories or ethnic categories, way higher percentages of certain populations in the military ended up having to take the test for illiterates. So the first thing that this demonstrated to psychologists and to the army was that the state of public education in America was terrible that basically because of the prevalence of child labor, lots of kids getting pulled out of school at the fourth grade, that basically you had these soldiers who were coming into the military that did not have even the basic skills to read an intelligence test. And so this becomes important because those results are widely disseminated throughout the United States. And what we start seeing is Mississippi, last state in the nation to pass compulsory education law in 1917. But more importantly, we start seeing states enforcing the laws that they actually have. And so school attendance begins to go up in the 1920s when people are able to link illiteracy to actually a deficiency in our national defense. In the modern army, it's difficult to be a good soldier without being able to read. You maybe could have done that at one time, but it's harder and harder to function in a large bureaucratic institution that way. And so we start seeing a push for educational reform and a decrease in child labor as a result of that. Right? And that's maybe one of the more positive results that we can see from this experiment in standardized testing. 
maybe less positive are the results of these tests. So I don't know how easy it is for you to see where you are in here, but hopefully you can kind of get a sense about what people were actually being asked to do. So here on this side, we have an intelligence test where essentially what the people are being asked to do here is draw in the thing that's missing. Right? So find what's missing in the picture and actually draw it in. And then this one, and these are just, there were six different tests in all. This particular test for literate recruits was a test of common sense. So it was a multiple choice test. We're going to ask you questions and we want a common sense answer here. Right? And so on this one, we can see that we look at the first one where you have to draw on the smile, and another one you have to draw on the eyes. We come down, you have to draw on a stamp maybe draw in the, the, the chimney. Uh, you get a little farther down. When I give these to my students, they're always good for the first few. And then we start getting a little farther down. People get a little confused here. Um, they can see there's a shadow missing. There's a net missing with the tennis court. Uh, number 18 always gives people trouble. This is an old fashioned phonograph. So you have to know that it's the horn that you actually have to, have to pull in here. And of course, a bowling ball in number 15 in this guy's hand. And I don't think you could read these with the common sense one. So I'll give you an example of at least one that I know my students never feel is actually the right answer. And that question here is, if a man made a million dollars, he ought to. And here are your three choices. Pay off the national debt. Well, that's funny, right, that a million dollars would pay off the national debt. Contribute to various worthy charities. Or C, give it to some poor man. Don't you love that the, there's not a choice for keep it and buy myself a lot of nice things, right? Ooh, sorry. It's, uh, it's, all, it's all about altruism here in terms of, in terms of what, you're, what you're doing, right? Now, what you might be thinking to yourselves here um, is are these, in fact, really tests of intelligence? Are they really testing the intelligence of people? Or are they instead testing other things? maybe their economic class. After all, let's consider the fact that you're a sharecropper in the South. How likely is it that you've ever played a game of tennis? Or that you've even seen a tennis court? Right? If you are, in fact, poor and you get money, is your first thought that you should distribute it to charities? Isn't that really sort of an upper middle class progressive notion? What is actually being tested here? And there were many critics of these tests who thought that really what was being tested were other things, like economic situation or your familiarity with mainstream culture. The results of the test seem to really bear out that criticism. You have, when you tabulate this, um, uh, a tabulation that white American soldiers had a mental age of 13. The average age for Russians was 11, for Italians was 11. Poles, Poles, 10, <laughs> and American-born blacks, uh, 10. And in the parlance of the time, anything below 11 labels you a moron. And that's actually the official designation for these particular, for these particular groups. Right? Now, for those critics who would say, well, see, this, this is exactly what you mean, for people who support the test, they say, well, this is a social, you know, social Darwinist world. In fact, we knew that these were lesser races. And these tests have only actually confirmed that. And so what you begin to see is the beginning of a debate about what standardized tests actually measure and what they don't. And if you're thinking to yourself that both this debate sounds familiar and maybe even some of these test questions sound familiar, you're not wrong. Because in 1926, the first SAT is created. And what do they use as their model? They use these tests. Okay. The Army is kind of iffy on the value of them, but the institution that loves the intelligence tests are public schools. Public schools love these. They institute them immediately after the war. They begin using them to track students. <laughs> we have an SAT that's modeled on them in terms of tracking aptitude. And we see that this experiment in standardized testing will dramatically reshape the educational system afterwards. <clears throat> so if you don't like standardized tests, you can thank World War I. Right? This is all the tests you've had to take in your life, measuring all your intelligence, your aptitude, and your skills. Now when these men go into the military, we've talked a little bit about how they're conscripted. 
about the tests that they have to take. They're going to sort them into a variety of jobs. About half of the men are going to eventually travel to France. And in France, they're going to encounter trench warfare. It's dramatically a new way to fight. And along the way, they're going to pick up fashion trends. They're going to pick up words that are going to also have a cultural impact on, the United, uh, on, the, on American culture. Right? And the first thing that we see suddenly becoming a new fashion, and many of you can look at your watches now as I'm saying this, are wristwatches, which were not popular before the First World War. Wrist, most people, if they had watches at all, had pocket watches. But a pocket watch is very inconvenient in the trenches. Right? It's very hard when you're crouching down in the mud to reach into your pocket when you've got all your other gear, take out a watch, open the cover, hope you have enough light to look, see the time, close the cover, put it back in your, pur in your purse, <laughs> put it back in your pocket, and then pick up your rifle and say to yourself, OK, it's time to go over the top. Right? not very practical at all. And so what soldiers begin to carry instead are wristwatches. And wristwatches are not just easier to look at, but they're also important because time matters in the trenches. Timing matters when you're fighting. When we think about the way trench warfare went, you have a lot of people, hundreds of thousands of people in one line, and they all have to coordinate their movements as they move forward out of the trenches. Most attacks start with artillery, so you have an artillery barrage that comes from the rear, right? That's going to be lobbed at the other side, hopefully weaken the other side enough so that when the barrage stops and the infantrymen themselves climb out of the trenches and go to the other side, they won't be hit by their own friendly fire, right? If the timing's wrong, that's not going to work, right? You could be coming out of the trench and your artillery barrage has not lifted, it could be the thing that kills you, right? So when we think about phrases like synchronize your watches, this also comes from the First World War. Because the idea of everybody knowing what time it was and agreeing with what time it was and being able to read the time, all those things mattered in terms of how the war was being fought. And so this new idea of wristwatches, this was going to come from the war as well. And then we can see just a whole slew of linguistic changes occurring because of the war. And these are all kinds of things that come out of the experience of fighting in the trenches, right? So if you've ever said something like, I think I aced that test, right? Or you felt shell-shocked from bad news. Or maybe you saw a movie the other day and you said it was a dud, right? These are all words that, without realizing it, have come from the war. They are things that soldiers brought home that newspapers reported and people began to share, right? So in World War I lexicon, an ace is a name for an expert pilot. Shell-shocked describes the psychological breakdown of men who endured artillery bombardments. And of course, a dud was a shell that failed to explode. And these are just a few examples of the kinds of words that come into the English language as a result of the war. How many of you use the word camouflage? I'll bet when you go on vacation, it's a souvenir that you get, not a memento or a keepsake. Right? Um, we call raincoats trench coats. Right? Now that I'm talking about the trenches, it's probably not a surprise to know that that's also a word that comes from the First World War. We call our friends buddies. We say that someone has cold feet when they have reluctance. Right? These are all words that we can trace back to the First World War. And if you had used these words before the First World War, most people would have no idea what you were talking about. Right? It creates a cultural understanding that changes even the way that people speak. And we can trace this sort of change in how people talk literally about the experience of war to World War I as well. And here I want to start with my point number five, which is Ernest Hemingway, and thinking about literature that actually talks about the experience of war in a completely different way. I'm not sure, you probably all read at least a little bit of Hemingway, but I'm not sure how many of you know that Hemingway fought in World War I. And he didn't fight on the Western Front, what I've been talking about. He actually volunteered for the Red Cross. He went to Italy, 
so he was in the Dolomite Mountains, and was wounded uh, in the front lines when he was passing out chocolate to troops there. Right? And he was severely wounded. He spent months in the hospital. He came home very depressed and uncertain about his war. And as he reflected on what the war had meant to him, he began to express the war in a completely different way. Right? And he didn't use words anymore that talked about war as glorious and as a thing that bestowed honor and meaning on life. He talked about war as something that really caused you to lose your illusions. And here's just an example of, of a letter that he wrote to his mother after he was wounded. And he said, when you go to war as a boy, you have great illusions of immortality. Other people get killed, not you. Then when you are badly wounded the first time, you lose that illusion. You know it can happen to you. And that's the kind of experience that leads him to actually talk about things in a dramatically different way. And I have a rather long excerpt here from one of his short stories, and I don't think I, I for the sake of time, that I, I want to read the whole thing. But basically, he writes this story in a soldier's home, and it's about this veteran who comes back. And he comes back, he's fought in all the major battles. And he comes back and he wants to talk to people about the war. But whenever he starts to talk to them and talk about his actual experiences, he finds that their eyes start to glaze over. Because the stories of war that he has to tell do not actually correspond to the stories that had been in the newspaper during the war. And so he says, when he begins talking, his town had heard too many atrocity stories to be thrilled by actualities. And so what he finds over time is that he begins to lie about his experiences. He begins to make them even bloodier and more gruesome and more awful than they actually were. Because that's the only way that he can get people to listen to him. And the more that he lies, the worse he feels about himself and about what he actually went through. And of course, in this story, when he ends it, he's sort of suggesting that, that, that the war had been a lie for America, right? That soldiers had gone and they had fought, they had been lied to, and the people at home didn't really want to hear the truth about the war. They only wanted to hear the lies, right? And this is, when we think about the lost generation in literature, one of the big themes of disillusionment, right? The disillusionment that people feel about there always being this disconnect between what the soldier experiences and what civilians actually really want to hear about war. And it becomes only the soldiers that really truly understand what they went through. And so in this sort of new vein of literature, we see a very different way of talking about war. If you took a Hemingway story and you compared it to a, a tale of combat from 1900, just like with words, they would bear almost no resemblance to each other. So out of the war, we have a new literature that begins, a new form of actually even talking about war. And when we think about um, Hemingway's complaint, right, that people really have been lied to and maybe seem only interested in the lies, he's speaking, in fact, to another reality of World War I, and that is the way that World War I really leads to a whole new field being born, and that's the field of public relations. I hinted a little bit at the way in which the war actually became a boon to psychology, absolutely true, the way that it was a boon to literature, it was also a boon to the idea of public relations. And public relations is different than advertising. It's, n it's, it's a whole different way to think about how you persuade people to do things they might not want to do. And World War I was the first war in which the government took a major and active role in shaping the way that people thought about the war. We enter late, there's a tremendous centralization of information. The main propaganda agency was the Committee on Public Information. And it's almost impossible for me to underestimate for you the extent of its reach. Every item of war news, whether in a newspaper or magazine, had either been written by a Committee Public Information official or censored according to rules that they issued. 
Newspapers were full of patriotic advertising, things like this reproduces ads, or even commercial advertising that incorporated patriotic themes. You want to go to the county fair? When you go there, there will be war exhibits, recreated trenches, maybe a few machine guns on display to talk to you about a war. Want to go to the movies? Well, these are silent movies during the First World War. And they have to change the reels in between. How long do you have between changing reels and a silent movie? You have four minutes. Why waste those four minutes in silence or talking to your friends? A four minute man is gonna jump up on stage and for those four minutes talk to you about the war. Why are we in it? What could you do? How could you actually participate, right? If you're a woman in that movie audience, it's likely that you're knitting because knitting is what women did to show their devotion to the war effort. In fact, it became almost unpatriotic to be seen out in public not knitting. It got so bad that we see things like this, which is an ad in the program of the New York Philharmonic, which is basically asking women in the audience for a few minutes to put their knitting needles down and actually listen to the concert. Because in fact, it was difficult to hear the symphony over the clatter of all those knitting needles, right? As, ooh, as, sorry, I can as women, as women were, were listening, right? This was how effective this propaganda was, okay? Now, if you leave the movie or symphony, you walk down the street, you will see a landscape covered with propaganda posters, telephone poles, billboards, walls, and in people's houses. All these placards to demonstrate to their neighbors that you had bought a Liberty Bond, that you were actually following the government's rules for conserving food, right? All of these completely daily reminders. Everybody's wearing a pin or a ribbon to show that they had subscribed to a different, a different fund drive, right? On Sunday in church, the pastor reads a sermon explaining the righteousness of the cause, and on Monday in class, school children study war maps distributed by the Committee on Public Information, right? Celebrities give speeches. Every part of American society in some way is permeated by this propaganda. It makes the war a part of your daily life. Everybody is thinking about it. And one government agency is primarily responsible for this, right? This is showing to people how you can, in fact, convince people seemingly overnight to put aside doubts that they had about fighting an unpopular war to showing overwhelming support for the war, so much so that if you refuse to do one of these things, you literally risk harm, physical harm to yourself, right? This was showing people the power of public relations. Right? The iconic image that comes out of the war is Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam, red, white, and blue, for obvious reasons. This one looks a little stern. You've seen it, I'm sure, a million times before. I bet you haven't seen this one. This is a little different view of Uncle Sam. Here it kind of gives a sense of why people were so willing to jump on board. This looks like fun. It's a big party to be involved in the war effort, right? It's, it gives you a sense of community, a sense of belonging. It's something that you, you're, you're happy to actually participate in. And it's these sort of different images of Uncle Sam that motivate people. We have wartime propaganda that dehumanizes the enemy. This is very effective as well. Now this matters for the war because it does help unify the home front. But the larger point that I want to actually emphasize is here is who else is paying attention to this? And one guy is a guy by the name of Edward Bernays, and I'm going to suspect you have not heard of him. But he worked for the Committee on Public Information during the war, and Edward Bernays is largely considered to be the father of modern public relations. He's the one who's considered to really come up with the techniques. And he watches what's happening. He says, you take this war, it's unpopular, and almost overnight through this public relations campaign, you turn it into something that it's not just that people grudgingly go along with, but they enthusiastically support. It's an amazing transformation in people's opinions and thoughts. How does this happen? And so he begins to kind of reflect on the, on the similarities between politics and consumption. 
And he says, you know, in a sense, people are happy to give over some decision making to other entities. So in this case of this quote here, we voluntarily agreed to let an invisible government sift the data and high spot the outstanding issues so our field of choice will be narrowed to practical proportions. In other words, the government, we don't want to know everything. We want the government to make some decisions for us or at least give us a reasonable range of options. And he says this actually is a good lesson for the marketplace here. Right? If people had to go through every kind of soap and every kind of shampoo to decide for themselves which is the better one, it would take a ridiculous amount of time. Nobody wants to go through that. So as advertising, you're helping people narrow the, their choices. You're helping make their life easier. And besides these kind of theoretical claims that he makes, he shows how the engineering of consent can be used in a way to sell all sorts of things. So during the war, the government uses it to sell war, which is not necessarily an easy kind of thing to sell. After the war, Bernays develops a lot of fame for a lot of his advertising campaigns, but one of them is actually um, through selling cigarettes. He becomes, he, this is kind of his, one of the most famous things that he does, because he looks back at campaigns like Liberty Bonds campaigns where you have these mass pageants, you get celebrities to come out and get people to part with their money, probably hard-earned money to support the war effort. And he gets hired by a cigarette company that says, you know, about half the population, it doesn't smoke that much. Women don't smoke a lot in the 1920s. It's not considered ladylike. How can you help make it socially acceptable for women to smoke? And so he organizes this public relations campaign called the Tortures of Freedom. And he hires these very beautiful women to march down Fifth Avenue smoking cigarettes. Right? And it's, it's a spectacle. It's a spectacle. He gets lots of free publicity for it, gets articles in the newspaper. Everybody's talking about it. And over the next few years, cigarette companies see their sales to women actually going up. And so this, this field of public relations learns from what the government had done during the war, turns it into techniques to how you actually teach people to consume more, and really transforms the way that people advertise their products. Now, I've talked a lot about sort of cultural stuff, um, now here about consumption and about advertising. I want to turn attention to some other parts of the war especially the way that the war has political changes for key social justice movements in the United States. Because there are two movements in particular that are very much transformed by the war. And the first one is the African American Civil Rights Movement. You can see from this poster here, this is a privately produced poster, there's tremendous hope within the African American community that Woodrow Wilson's claim that this will be a war to spread democracy would actually mean an improvement for democratic rights and civil rights at home. And this is a poster that actually encapsulates that hope. We can see that there's resistance to that idea as well. And this is a quite different poster, um, only in the way that it's interpreted, not really in what it says. We have a poster here that's uh, very patriotic. It shows us a rather middle-class family looking adoringly at the father who's serving in the military. We have two signs that he's both alive and that he's a combatant. He has a German helmet above those American flags, so that signifies that he has been to France and at least been able to mail home a new souvenir, as we now, as we now call mementos uh, in the First World War era. We know he's alive because the flag in the window has a blue star, not a gold star. A gold star would have meant that he's killed. And we can see that he reveres American political leaders. We have a picture of Washington, Lincoln, and Woodrow Wilson. Nothing in this poster that might suggest anything but a patriotic family doing its duty during the war. The reason I'm telling you that it means something more is that when you have these privately produced propaganda posters, often they're difficult to find as an historian because for all the people at the end of the war, they were trash. They just threw them away. We have the government ones because you have government librarians who actually preserve them. 
And this one we have because a postmistress general in Melbourne, Florida sent it to the postmaster general and she asked him, was this the type of seditious material that should be banned from the mails under the terms of the Espionage Act? So I'm telling you, this is a patriotic poster. These are people that are doing their bit. They're joining in the cause. This woman sees something that's seditious, traitorous, something that should not be seen by anybody in the United States. Right? What is she seeing that I'm not seeing? She's seeing a destabilization of the racial status quo. Right? She's seeing a black family that aspires to middle class status or has actually achieved middle class status. Maybe they live in a nicer house than she does. Right? She sees this claim that the war is going to mean improved democracy at home as a threat. Right? And that's a threat that should actually be stamped out. And so this is going to tell us that the war is going to lead to a lot of disagreements about how racial justice should be achieved in the United States. It's not going to be the end of the story, it's the beginning of the story. And scholars now point to the First World War as the beginning of the modern civil rights movement. And they point to it for several reasons. Because the veterans who come home, and none of them is more important than Charles Hamilton Houston, come home with a determination to renew the fight for civil rights in a new direction. They come home more militant, they come home with new strategies, they come home ready to join the NAACP, which becomes a major institution at the end of the First World War, and they come home because, with that attitude because of their experiences in France and because of Woodrow Wilson's rhetoric. And Charles Hamilton Houston, whose name may not be familiar to you, but it should be, because he is the legal genius behind the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision. He is the person that devised that legal strategy that ends up in that historic court case in 1954 that desegregates American schools. And that story begins in 1919 and comes out of the war. So this experience mattered for the United States and for, for these individuals, right? Now, the second sort of big movement that is affected by the First World War is female suffrage. How many women in this audience voted in their first presidential election? Yes. Thank you, World War I. Right. 19th Amendment comes out of the First World War. Now this had been a movement that had been ongoing. It was not the beginning of the movement, but it was the end. Right, so we have, in a sense, World War I as the beginning of the modern civil rights movement for African Americans, and in a sense, the end of a long movement and campaign for female suffrage. And there were several reasons for this. Right? One, again, I don't think you can actually read this here, but in this political cartoon it says, are you good if you are good enough for war, you are good enough to vote. Right? And here, in a sense, was the idea that the vote was a just recognition for all that knitting, no, not really. <laughs> for knitting, for working in factories, for nursing, right? For being supportive of, of the war, for actually doing their bit. And in that sense, it's kind of like, yeah, you get it because you earned it, right? And, it, and, and men can bestow it on, onto you. We tell that part of the story a lot. There's another part of the story that I like to tell because I think it gets left out. And the part that gets left out is that the, the, the suffrage movement splits during the war. And there's one half that's very moderate. And they say, that's right. We should go to do our bit, prove that we're loyal, and we will be rewarded at the end. But there's another part of the movement that's very radical. And they're like, absolutely not. This is the moment to press ahead. And so these women, the radicals, they devise a brand new tactic of political protest. They start picketing the White House. Now, nobody had done that before. Nobody had thought of that. And they stand outside. And they basically call Woodrow Wilson a hypocrite, right? They're like, here you have, how, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? And this one's even better, right? Where after the first Russian Revolution went for a short time into parliamentary government, and one of the first things that parliamentary government does in Russia is give women the right to vote. And they stand outside when, when a um, representative of the, of the new uh, Russian government comes to visit the White House, and basically say, we, the women of America, tell you that America is not a democracy. 
20 million American women are denied the right to vote. President Wilson is the chief opponent of their national enfranchisement. Help us make this nation really free. Tell our government that it must liberate its people before it can claim free Russia as an, as an ally. Right? So these women are standing out with these signs in front of the White House. And if you think they can do that without antagonizing people, you're wrong. They're attacked, they're arrested, they're beaten, they're put in jail, they go on a hunger strike, they're force fed. The word gets out to the press, they get bad press, they get released, they go back to the White House, they burn Wilson in effigy. Right? They're tough, right? They're not going to take no for an answer. And so I'm not trying to suggest that their antics alone get the vote, but they embarrass Wilson, they embarrass him, and they make him much more willing to negotiate with the moderate side of the House, which they do. And so we have, as a result of the war, the kind of final winning strategizing for actually having women achieve the right to vote. Right? Nine, we're getting there, only got two more. The final sort of social movement that I want to talk about goes back to the soldiers. And that's these soldiers when they come home. And when American soldiers come home, they may not all have the literary skill of Hemingway, but they certainly came home and became disillusioned. And for many American soldiers, their disillusionment had less to do with the sense that the American public did not understand the fighting they experienced, but more when they looked at what had happened to America while they were gone. And in 1919, there's a very severe recession in the United States. These guys all come home and they find it very difficult to get jobs. A lot of strikes, there's a lot of racial rioting. 1919 is not a good year in the United States. And they look at their friends who stayed home, who got deferments, who didn't have to go fight, and they see that actually they made really good wages during the war. And they look at the owners of munitions plants and find that they made a lot of money. Banks made a lot of money. And they become very agitated about the fact that a good chunk of America seems to have profited from this war. And the men that fought it came home and not only don't have much help readjusting, they can't find jobs and that's just tough luck. So they begin to agitate for something called adjusted compensation. And adjusted compensation is the idea that the government should actually retroactively pay them more money for having served in the military. Basically adjust their compensation, adjust their wages. And at first they're hitting the workers who made a lot, but pretty soon they know that that's not going to go anywhere. So they begin really focusing on war profiteers. That it's immoral for these people to have made so much money out of the war while the fighting man had to get by on $30 a month. And they agitated in 1924, they're successful, and they get something called an adjusted compensation certificate. So they don't get the money outright, but it's a bond. And so it's an IOU from the government. The government says, in 20 years, you can cash this in, and for most veterans, they're going to get about $1,200. That's a lot of money right, in 1924. It's a lot of money now. I would take it. Right? Come the Depression, veterans are not very happy to wait around for this money. So we need it now. And this is where we get the bonus march. So the bonus march in 1932 is a demonstration by about 40,000 veterans who march on Washington, D.C., and they demand immediate payment of their adjusted compensation certificate. They're routed out of the city uh, by the Army. The Army pushes them out. Um, there are some people who feel that this helps elect uh, Frederick, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, in 1932. They don't get paid their bonus until 1936. Um, but this is kind of a scary thing for the government to see because when those veterans came, nobody was really sure what they were there to do. Right? They said, well, we're just here to peacefully protest. But there are people like Douglas MacArthur, who was chief of staff, who said, uh-uh, they have come to overthrow the government. Right? This is a coup. These people are trained. They know what they're doing. Right? This is dangerous. This is, you know, at the, at the worst moment in the Depression, we're going to actually have a revolution in this country. Right? This is what people are afraid of. Fast forward to 1944. You're starting to think about World War II ending. And you're starting to think about 16 million veterans coming home this time. How are they going to be treated? And this memory of the bonus marches in people's heads. It's like, oh my god, well, if it was this bad when we had 4 million men come home. Imagine what 16 million men could do. Right? If the Depression comes back, which is what everybody thinks is going to happen, 
we're truly going to have trouble on our hands. And World War I veterans who run the American Legion say, you're right, and we have a plan. And our plan is a GI Bill of Rights. This is what you're going to do. You can give these guys a year of unemployment insurance. You can give them tuition so they can go to college or maybe they can go to a vocational school. You're going to help them buy a house or a mortgage. You're going to make sure that they get medical care. Right? You're going to give them, basically, a way to readjust. And they've earned this because this is their adjusted compensation. You're not giving them anything. right? War workers still made a lot of money in World War II. Corporations still made a lot of money in World War II. But this time, instead of giving them a bond, you're going to give them these rights. Right? These are their rights. And the GI Bill of Rights transforms the way we bring veterans home. It transformed our society. It created many people feel a stable middle class in the 1950s. Right? And that piece of legislation, even though it's passed in 1944, comes out of World War I. Because it's the memory of the bonus march, and it's the American Legion led by World War I veterans that makes that piece of legislation a reality. And so in that sense, there's no doubt but that we are all influenced by the kind of impact that the war had on American society. And so now to my last point, are you ready for this? <laughs> and that is this idea of learning lessons. So here I just gave you an example of that in terms of learning a lesson, right, from World War I, which was learning the lesson of the bonus march. But there were other lessons that Americans tried to derive from the war in the 1930s, especially as it looked like we might have to fight another war, or at least another war was going to happen in Europe. And this lesson was a different lesson. It was that America had made a mistake by getting into the First World War. And we should do everything we could to not repeat those mistakes. So we passed a lot of neutrality laws in the 1930s that actually in attempt to not replicate those mistakes. We're not going to loan money to warring nations if we're out of the war. We're not going to sell them arms. We're not going to carry those arms in our ships. All these things that we thought we had done wrong the first time around. And this painting that I have up here, a painting by John Stuart Curry, kind of encapsulates this feeling in the 1930s that World War I had been a big mistake, and that was the lesson to learn. And this painting is called Parade to War Allegory. And if we sort of look at different portions of the painting, what we see is at the center a young couple, right? They're sweethearts, and she's, she's seeing him off to war. And we've got the young boys that are all caught up in the pageantry. This is what had happened in the First World War. We go out to the sides of the painting, and we see the two people who actually remember the war, the grieving mother and the widow, right? The grieving mother has her back to the couple. She's so overcome by grief, she can't speak. And the widow is held back by the policeman. She cannot reach that couple to tell them what she knows. Right? But if we look even closer at the faces of the men, we can see that they are literally turning to corpses before our eyes. They are already the dead right? before they have even left American shores. And so in this, oops, sorry. in this formulation, too much there, in this formulation, the lesson is that the war had been a mistake. Stay out of the war as long as we possibly could. But if we look ahead to what actually happens and how we look back at World War II, we now say, oh, well, that was the mistake because World War II had nothing to do with World War I. It was a different war. And maybe our mistake this time around was staying out for as long as we did, right? Staying out until Pearl Harbor. And so this is the point on which I'd like to conclude. And that is that maybe the greatest impact of history in general is not to try to study it to learn lessons from it. Because as you can see from the examples I gave, maybe you learn the right lesson, but maybe you learn the wrong lesson. Right? It's very difficult to know what lesson it is that you're deriving. I think, in fact, it's a much safer bet to use history and study history to learn how we became who we are, how it left a lasting impact on the way we live our lives and the beliefs that we have, the social institutions that we have, and that, in a sense, is maybe what I've tried to convey today, going through all of these things, that it would be very nice for me to believe that you will all walk out of this room and never once again think that World War I does not matter for the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you.